Hello, this is Joe, the old star geezer. I'd like to welcome you back to Looking Up. This is Act 3 of our series, Triangles and Teapots. If you've not yet watched the first two episodes, I would recommend that you do so before you watch this one. Also, I suggest that you watch these episodes in full screen so as not to miss any of the details I will be showing you about the night sky. Great! Let's take a look at the constellations you can see in the summertime sky. Over the last few years, the weather patterns where I live have changed quite a bit. During the summer months, we have showers and thunder showers quite a few nights, so it's rare that we get a good night for stargazing. Here's hoping you get a chance to see a good summer night sky. If you're out on a midsummer night, look straight up around 1030. You should be able to make out three bright stars that form a right triangle. The corner star of this triangle will be one of the brightest stars you see tonight. Its name is Vega. The other two corners are anchored by Deneb and Altair. These three stars form a pattern we call the Summer Triangle. Remember our discussion of the Big Dipper and how it wasn't a constellation, just a very recognizable pattern in the northern sky? Well, the Summer Triangle is the same idea. It's a pattern that's easily recognizable, but each of these three stars are part of three different constellations. Vega sits at the heart of a small constellation known as Lyra the Lyre. Uh, no, we're, we're not talking about lyre as in liar, liar, pants on fire. A lyre is a small harp held in one hand and played with the other. The story is told of a, a Greek named Orpheus, who was a great musician and poet and who perfected the playing of the lyre. The gods were so impressed with his skill that they placed his lyre in the heavens. Ancient Britons called this group of stars King Arthur's Harp. There is a dim star near Vega, this one. If you have a good pair of binoculars, take a look at this star. You will find that there are really two stars there. This is what astronomers call a double star. Two stars so close together in the sky that they appear as one to the unaided eye. Through a small telescope, it can be seen that these two stars are also doubles. There are really four stars here, not just one. This is often referred to as the double-double in Lyra and is often the focus of backyard telescopes. Moving on to Deneb, you can see that it marks the end of a lowercase letter T pattern. I often saw these stars as an old diamond-shaped T-frame kite flying across the sky. You can see the shape here. I even stole a few stars for the tail. Some people see this as a Christian cross. Kite or cross, this is the constellation of Cygnus, the swan. Deneb is the swan's tail. You can see the mighty wings stretched across the sky. The long neck points south with a bright star to represent the swan's eye. Several myths lie around the swan. One is that our friend Orpheus, who played the lyre so well, was changed into a swan and placed in the sky near his beloved lyre. Remember our old friend Zeus? Well, one legend with him is that he fell in love with another mortal woman named Leda. I guess Leda really liked swans because old Zeus changed himself into a swan so he could visit her without her husband knowing about it. Arab astronomers called this the flying eagle, and to some Greeks it was simply called the bird. Speaking of birds... The star Altair, the last of the three summer triangle stars, represents the tail of Aquila the eagle. His wings are stretched out like the swans, and his neck and beak show up here. A carved stone from over 3,200 years ago shows this constellation as an eagle called Alula. Other titles for this constellation were Eagle of the Winds, or simply Soaring Eagle. Many ancient cultures saw this and simply called it the eagle. So, there's our triangle. Where's the teapot? Well, it's right here in the southern sky. Four stars for the pot. Three stars for the lid. Four stars for the handle. And three stars for the spout. 
Remember the nursery rhyme, I'm a little teapot? The teapot is another of those star patterns like the Big Dipper or the Summer Triangle. By the way, astronomers call these star patterns asterisms. The teapot is part of a larger constellation known as Sagittarius, the archer. Sagittarius is also a centaur, that half-man, half-horse creature of ancient legend. In this image, he's lying over on his side a bit, but I think we can use our imagination and sort of make him out. The handle of the teapot marks his waist. The top star of the lid marks his rear, and you can use a few stars around here to make a tail and a rear leg. Here's a front leg, and moving up his body, you can make out an arm drawing back on a bow. A few stars to mark his head, the arrow shaft, and a neat diamond pattern to mark the arrow head. I will tell you that many people see Sagittarius turned around the other way with his arrow pointing west not east. I like this interpretation better, though, especially because of the arrowhead. In Greek legend, the centaur was named Chiron, a great musician, marksman, and healer. He supposedly taught mankind how to use plants and herbs for medicine. In myth, Chiron was killed by a poison arrow and was placed in the sky by the gods to honor his achievements. Up above Sagittarius, high in the southern sky, is a large constellation that many people have never heard of. In fact, it's really two constellations that sort of intertwine over a large area of sky. These are the constellations Aphiuchus, the giant, and Serpens, the snake. Aphiuchus was a physician who was supposedly trained by Sagittarius, or Chiron, his students were snake worshippers, believing that snakes gave them the power to heal or even to raise the dead. Hades, the god of the dead, was angered at this and persuaded Zeus to remove Aphiuchus from earth and placed him in the heavens. Below Aphiuchus is a constellation that in my eyes really looks like its name. This is Scorpius the Scorpion. Here's the head of the scorpion its long, curving body, the hook of its tail, and even a star thrown in for good measure to represent the scorpion's sting. The legends around Scorpius include an epic battle between him and another legend of the sky, Orion the Hunter. We'll learn all about that battle when we take a look at Orion in our Winter Sky episode. Stick around. The bright star in the scorpion's heart is called Antares. Now, some of you may have already noticed that something seems to be missing from the night skies that I've been showing you. Actually, two different types of something are missing, the moon and the five visible planets. After we've covered the main constellations for each season of the year, I will be doing an episode of the show that covers just the moon and the planets. The reason for doing it this way is so that you can concentrate on learning the constellations. If you go outside and look at the stars, you will likely at some time see the moon. When the moon is in the sky, it tends to outshine the stars, especially when it's near full. The planets, on the other hand, can appear as bright stars in the sky. The only problem is that they move around from week to week and month to month. Unless you know exactly when and where to look, that can be problematic. If you go out and find Scorpius, and you go out a year from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, Scorpius will still look exactly the same as it does now. The stars are very, very, very far away. That's a subject we'll also cover in later episodes. The stars are moving around the universe, but since they are so very far away, and since our sun is basically moving with them, the star patterns we see don't change much over the years. The planet Mars often appears in our sky as a bright reddish-orange star. The star Antares is also reddish-orange in color. Aha! I bet you didn't notice that stars have color, have you? Some are reddish, some are bluish, some are yellow, some are white. 
Anyway, since the planets move around a lot, sometimes the planet Mars is near the constellation of Scorpius. Ancient people would sometimes mistake the red star Antares for the planet Mars. And that's how Antares got its name. Basically, the name means not Mars. Out in front of the Scorpion are a couple of bright stars that belong to the constellation of Libra, the balance. It's not much to see here, just two stars here and two dimmer stars below that kind of form a square, I guess. This is one constellation that was actually named by the Romans. The Greeks regarded these stars as part of the constellation of Scorpius. They represented the outstretched claws of the scorpion. Arab astronomers apparently agreed with the Greeks as these two stars are named Zubines Chamali and Zubinel Ganubi. Arab words that translate roughly as Northern Claw and Southern Claw. I usually just call them the Zubin brothers. The last constellation we will learn in this episode lies high in the summer sky near Vega. This star pattern looks like a slightly warped letter H to me. H for Hercules. I would be very surprised if you have never heard that name. Hercules was one of the most powerful heroes of Greek legend. In fact, this constellation is one of the oldest named ones in the sky. The most famous story about him involved the Twelve Labors of Hercules, a list of twelve tasks he had to perform to prove to the gods that he was worthy. He had to kill a huge lion, and we'll learn more about that lion when, he's, when we study the spring sky. He had to kill a mythical beast named Hydra, a huge creature with many heads. The problem was that every time you chop off a head, two grow back in its place. And those were only two of his twelve challenges. You can think of Hercules as the Greek version of Captain America. <laughs> his place in the night sky was, of course, assured by the Greek gods. Before we leave, in the past people have asked me about my favorite constellation. And there are 88 of them in the sky, and it kind of makes it a hard question to answer. Still, there is one small constellation that I've always found to be fun to find. I learned about it as a young boy. Depending upon your sky, you may or may not be able to make it out because the stars that form it are very dim. Just to the east of Altair is a small diamond-shaped pattern of stars with a few stars trailing behind it. This is the constellation of Delphinus the Dolphin. And I've always thought it looked like a dolphin playfully jumping out of the water. The story is told of the poet Arion, who was sailing back home on a ship. The sailors were jealous of his fame and plotted to throw him overboard. Arion played his lute, and the music attracted a pot of dolphins. He then jumped overboard, and one of the dolphins carried him on his back safely to shore. Of course, Poseidon, god of the sea, honored the dolphin by placing it in the night sky. Apparently, with the Greek gods, that was the greatest honor they could bestow. There are other stories in the night sky, but they will have to wait until the next act. Heroes and Monsters, where we study the constellations of autumn. See you soon, and remember, keep looking up. <laughs>